Thank you, Paula. This is beautiful. No. But it always is every Sunday. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Well, I'm Charlene Ball, and I'd like to welcome you to Unity Church of Maine. Uh, we welcome our old timers and our newcomers. <laughs> and the chaplain today is Charlene Ball. How about that? Um, I'm available in the chaplain's prayer room, which is that open door right back there from 11.30 to 11.50. And please join us for coffee and treats after the service. Okay, let's take a moment for prayer. Holy Spirit, in this time of prayer, we affirm the presence of your light and your love. We release all cares or concerns knowing that you are our ever-present support and comfort. We know it and sense it. Through this sacred connection, we act with courage and confidence. Our faith is strengthened, attentive and grateful for the life of God in and all around us, we are uplifted in spirit. We are blessed beyond measure. We know and accept that it is not our will, but your will to be done. We thank you, Holy Spirit, as our lives are filled with your peace, your power, and your presence as we seek to have a closer relationship with you. Thank you, God, and so it is. Amen. Okay. As we say the Unity Worldwide Affirmation and the Unity Main Affirmation, I invite you to think of them as a prayer and holding them in collective intention. Please join me in saying Unity's Worldwide Affirmation. Together, there is one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God, the good, omnipotent. And the Unity of Aims Affirmation, together, through the Christ Spirit in us, we create a better church and a better world. So be it. Hey, Todd, you're going to read the daily word today? I will do so. Okay. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Today is free. Centered in spirit, I am free. August 16th. At times, I may feel restrained by my circumstances. I have commitments to keep, bills to pay, and my inner critic to calm. That's the truth. Um, I may wonder how to get out of this stagnant state. Then I turn to God for guidance. I shift my focus from lack to abundance. Freedom comes within. That's so important, I'm gonna say it again. Freedom truly does come from within. And I have the power to create a sense of freedom in my life. A change in my attitude often is all I need to be free. I also may need to change the way I communicate to free myself from frustrations. Instead of keeping things bottled up, I share my feelings and needs openly. I am empowered to ask for what I need. When it's my turn to listen, I feel compassionate. I breathe before reaching, or excuse me, I breathe before reacting and respond with love. Centered in spirit, I am free. And the scripture for today comes from 2 Samuel verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 37. <coughs> Excuse me, there's dust in the air. You have made me stride freely, and my feet do not slip. Mm, thank you. <coughs> thank you, John. Death has the lesson. Willing for God. Okay. Amen. Hello there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The best 
see you each morning. Remember that? Baby Pedro Kellogg's. That's to you. Right. Good morning. Okay, here we are. Okay. Let go! Let God! Alright, let's try it again. This side. Let go! Third time's charm. Let's try it over here. Okay, this time it's gonna work, right? Let go! Oh God! Oh. Not so much. Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard to let go and give it to God? It seems simple, but it's not easy. And we are all a little bit like Emily Latella. Remember Emily Latella from the old Saturday Night Live TV show? She would go on a rant. Somebody does. You nod. It's good. <laughs> she would go on a rant about, I don't know why there's so much violins on TV. Why are they all upset about that? We need more violins on TV. I don't know why they're so upset about this violins on TV. And then Chevy Chase would correct her. And he would say, Emily, no, it's violence on TV. Violence. And she would sit back and go, oh, oh well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is with me and God. I stew about a situation. I worry about it. I get all upset about it. This sticky thing that I can't seem to solve, this aggravating decision that never seems to be resolved or never seems to be fixed or finished. And then I give it to God and just moments later I say, oh well, never mind. Never mind. I'll take it. I'll keep it. But what does it mean to be willing toward God? What does it mean for us to truly be willing toward God? For that's the true power of will. That is what we're aiming for, this power of will, as opposed to just willpower. Now, in our book that we've been working through about this, William Morch says, in his very first statement about this, one has a tremendous overcoming when he is able to be willing toward God. But the development of this ability comes through the many surrenderings of old ways. Good. That might be our first clue why this is so hard. One has a tremendous overcoming when he is able to be willing toward God, but the development of this ability comes through the many surrenderings. The many surrenderings of old ways. Well, the word tremendous to me and many surrenderings are really kind of the key pivotal points here. And the tremendous suggests to me that this is a bit like climbing Pike's Peak. It's just a bit like climbing Pike's Peak. It's not easy. It will take some training. It will take some conditioning. And it will take planning and discipline to stay the course, right? It's not easy. And surrenderings, here a plural, not just surrendering, but surrenderings more than once, suggests to me that this is not a one-shot deal. It's not a few prayers, some meditations, and then an Instagram, and bing, I'm done. I've surrendered. I don't think it quite works like that. It's not an Instagram situation, not so much. Or a Twitter. I'll tweet this and then I'll have it taken care of. I don't think it's like that. Now, a one-time surrendering of your will is usually not that hard. One and done, that's not too hard. And if it's someone that you won't see again, someone that you aren't all that attached to, that their good opinion of you is not all that important to you, well, then maybe it's a lot easier to let go and let God have it. 
and just be done with it. As I sat with this whole journey this past week, wrestling with this talk, the journey from willpower to willingness, it's not an easy journey. And I realized, and I told you a story last week about being at the convention, and I was with colleagues, classmates, and we're all in ministry, and one of the women in this little group said, well, I'm glad to see I'm not the only one on the first years of ministry weight gain plan, which of course landed like a lead balloon, right? And it got very quiet. But I didn't take that to heart, and I didn't let it hang in my consciousness. And why not? Well, it was a one-shot deal, I realized. I don't see her very often. And there's enough goodwill in our friendship that it wasn't going to poison it. So it was easier to let it go. Then as I sat wrestling with this whole journey of willfulness <coughs> to willingness, it occurred to me that in all honesty, she did not say anything to me, anything worse about weight than that inner critics committee that was in the Daily Word has said on any given occasion. Right? Because we all have that inner critics committee. And it's taking a tally of whatever it is that the issue is that's got you. And we all have one. And that committee says all kinds of rude things to us that no one else ever hears. Why do we do that? Why is it we do that? Well, I, I think we do that because then no one else can ever say anything worse to us than we were already thinking. If I've already heard the worst in my own head, there's nothing anybody else is going to say that's worse than what I've already said to myself. Wow. Wow. That's a little bit yucky. That's no way to live. How's that working for you, Deb? Not so well. Because here's the deal that I've learned in observing just myself, that when your mind is full of all of those kind of snarky little remarks about it becomes very easy to think them and say them about someone else. And they kind of leak out of you. That energy just kind of leaks out of you. <coughs> so this inner critic committee has really got to go. I mean, it's really been there too long. It's got to go. But how? Because I don't think just willing it gone quite gets it. I don't think willing it gone and willpower gets it gone or would be gone by now because I sure don't like it. I don't enjoy it, but it's a habit. We have those thought habits. And they really are sticky. As I reflected on this whole willingness journey this past week, I realized that giving up willpower for willingness is like climbing Pike's Peak. Pike's Peak is 14,000 some odd feet. It's a long journey. It does take planning, discipline, and training, and you've got to get used to the altitude to be able to stay the course. You've got to get used to a higher place in your consciousness to stay the course. And maybe, maybe I can't quite tackle Pike's Peak. That seems like insurmountable. So maybe I start with Harney Peak. Harney Peak is in South Dakota at 7,000 feet. I can deal with that. So I'll go at something that's not quite so daunting because the way I have to do this is one of those critical comments at a time one of those be willing toward God situations at a time. Maybe the key to our tremendous overcoming is just right here, 
between our ears. Because who is in charge of the inner critic committee anyway? Now, I was writing this before I read the Daily Word, and then I read the Daily Word, and it was like, oh, <laughs> the inner critic committee. This is divine order. We all have this inner critic committee. Who's in charge? Who's the chair of this thing? William Warch goes on to say that it is the power of will that's the chair of this inner critic committee. The power of will. Wow. The power of spirit. The power of God in me is in charge of this. And then if I let God be in charge, then it all works out a lot better, usually. What's the better choice? That's where surrendering to God's will comes in. What's the better choice? Well, the power of will, Charles Fillmore locates it in the um, frontal lobes of our brain. It's right in the front of your brain. It's in that executive part of your brain that makes decisions, that plans, that would plan your trip up Pike's Peak. It's where we have the power to think and organize and think through the steps and the consequences of everything we do. That power of executive functioning of our brain is really important. We rely on it all the time. In fact, we want to let go and let God, but our human brain has such an incredible capacity to figure out how things work that it gets addicted to knowing how. We get addicted to wanting to know, I want to know how this is going to work out. I want to know how my prayer is going to be answered. I want to know how this conflict is going to be resolved. And I want to know it now, God. Right? We are really hooked on that, wanting to know the how. And as soon as we are really deep into this how business is when we start tripping over it. We start tripping over our own need to know how this is going to work. We, we keep tripping over it because we are so attached to it. Because it's worked. And we rely on it. Until we don't. We are like the rich young man who cannot let go of his possessions. Are you familiar with that story, the rich young man in the Bible? It's a story in the Gospel of Matthew, and the deal is, this is one of those few places where Jesus invites someone to follow him, invites someone who really wants to follow him, and this person, this rich young man, cannot do it. There aren't many instances where people say no, or they walk away, but this is one of them. And it's interesting that it got documented in the story of Matthew. Here's how it goes down. It's from Matthew 19, verse 20 through 26. And the rich young man has just told Jesus, I follow the commandments, I honor my father and my mother, I honor God, I um, do not murder or commit adultery. I don't, I don't bear false witness. So I'm a moral person and I'm doing all the right things. So the young man said to him, I've kept all these. What do I still lack? What do I lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded. And they said, well, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible. 
But for God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Well, what's that about? If we go into that story and we substitute the word, Jesus says, if you wish to be perfect, if we substitute the word willing, if you wish to be willing, then give up all your attachments, all your attachments to knowing how, how things are going to work out. If you want to follow me, let go of all that you are attached to in this human understanding at that level. You know, the typical interpretation of this is that it's impossible for rich people to get into heaven because they must have done something really bad, right? So they're never going to get to heaven because they're rich. That's been a conundrum that everyone's wrestled with. But I don't think it's about that at all. It's about your consciousness and willingness. It's about letting go, being willing to really let go of all the beliefs that you're attached to, all of the ways that you want to know how things are going to work. It's letting go of all of that. So if you substitute the word willing for perfect, Right? If I'm just willing and I will let go of my will, I will surrender my will, then that is what opens the door to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is just about our consciousness. We can't get into a consciousness of God when we're still singing the song last week, I want it my way. Remember that? We can't get there when we're stuck in that same old song. And that doggone song was a thought worm in my head all week long. <laughs> and when we want to do it my way, we're like the rich young man. We won't let go. We're so attached to what our ego says is the right way. And Jesus doesn't give him a human prescription you know, or how this works. He doesn't explain the how. He doesn't tell them how it works. He just says, for God, all things are possible. Right? So when we get into that consciousness of God, then all things are possible. Even when we have absolutely no idea how. Where is the money going to come from? Where are the people going to come from? Where is this going to come I have no idea how, but I believe that with God all things are possible because that's what Jesus says to do, get to that place, surrender. When I worked in the telephone prayer ministry at Silent Unity, so many of the callers called with a specific prayer about an attachment to an outcome they were praying for. Please make my awful rotten boss quit his job so I can enjoy mine, right? Everybody had an attachment. May my nasty ex-husband move to Alaska so I don't have to deal with him. You wouldn't believe the kinds of prayers people would have. They wanted advice. They wanted some sort of magical answer. And I think because they were calling silent unity, they figured we had some sort of direct pipeline and that they were guaranteed the outcome they were asking for. They wanted reassurance that it would turn out exactly the way they wanted it to. After all, God answers prayers and surely in silent unity, we've got a special connection, right? Not so much. Not so much. The closing statement to all the prayers. We had several different closing statements, but the one I found using myself using the most frequently was, now we choose to trust. Letting God be present in all of our affairs, our health matters, our relationships. 
whatever the prayer need was, now we choose to trust. Knowing that the power and presence of God is working out the perfect solution, the perfect resolution in accordance with divine law, in accordance with the law of love, with the energy and the harmony of the universe. Amen. In other words, let go and let God. Sometimes people would hear that and then they would just start up immediately again with the story. It was amazing. But I want to know how blah, 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 blah. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, dear one, pause. Pause. Choose to trust. We're letting God take charge of this. We're letting God be in charge. We're letting God's will prevail, whatever it might be. We're letting that be known and at work here. Because we are all the rich young man. We are all so full of our own ideas of how things should be and how they should work out. I know I am. It takes tremendous self-awareness and self-discipline, tenacity, and a whole lot of commitment passion to let go, to let God. You can only climb Hardy Peak, Pikes Peak, Mount Shasta up in Minnesota, or the hill down the street. What is it? California. Oh, okay. You can only climb that one step at a time. One step at a time. So when you're willing toward God, you're just willing one little inch at a time. And with a lot of faith, understanding, wisdom, love, and strength. It's not surprising that will is this far along in the 12 powers, right? We've already activated wisdom, love, strength, faith. In order to be able to surrender our will, that we can experience the view from the mountaintop. The view from the mountaintop, and what is that view? When we have that view from that higher perspective, the Christ consciousness of us, we can see ourselves and one another as God sees us through the eyes of love. God does not share that inner committee that is constantly criticizing us. That's not how God sees us. God doesn't see defects. God doesn't see shortcomings. And when we get to a higher place, we can look back and we can see where we've been. We can say, I used to say that to myself all the time, and now I don't. Right? I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can look back and realize that God was present <coughs> in that situation. God gave us that teacher that we did not want to have. God gave us that situation that we did not like. God gave us all of it so we could come into this higher consciousness of the Christ. God was present even though we felt trapped and somewhat hopeless. God was there. And so then we can say with great feeling and deep humility and really mean it, Thy will, not my will. We can truly will to will God's will. So let us take that into meditation. And we're going to sing, I am at peace. Because that's where we get when we really step into God's will. We get to that place of freedom and peace that passes all understanding. <coughs> <coughs>
and just relax and be at peace as you breathe and allow your in-breath and your out-breath to lengthen. And let your energy and your attention just fall into your heart space. For the heart has its very own brain. The heart has its very own intelligence. <coughs> the heart has its ability to know without knowing how it knows. Come back to this time and this place, refreshed, restored, <laughs> willing toward God, knowing that at any time we revisit this peace of the heart, this inner peace <coughs> of the heart, to let God have whatever it is that troubles us. We close today by singing again to affirm that we are at peace. Oh,
spirit in the community of Ames and in this community and in the larger world. We are so grateful for all that we have been given and that all we are able to give. And so for all of the blessings realized and yet to be realized together, we say thank you, God. One more time. Thank you, God. And one more time. Thank you, God. And now we make our closing circle and over here. Peace song.